hanging out with like an old lady who's trying to figure out new technology. <laughs> okay, so animal fun session number five. This is our last one. This is Animals Who Changed History. And this is your last session with me for Summer Camp 2020. So thank you for all of you who've been watching from week one and thanks for coming along on this journey with me. And for those of you who just came once or twice, thank you for checking out all the cool things animals can do. And while I wish I could do this with you live and show you super cool animals in real life, I hope you were still able to take away some cool animal facts or learned like how to train your animals at home from week one, cool animal jobs that exist like to Croatian bombies, cool jobs you can do when you grow up, like be an investigator who helps animals or be a trainer at a zoo, uh, animal sports, which was last week, like horse soccer and snail racing. And then finally, here we are today, 11 animals who changed the course of history. And there are so many more than these 11, like the snake who killed Cleopatra and Leica the space dog. But these are animals that you might not learn about in school when you guys do go back. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys about them. So I hope you guys are ready. So today we're going to talk about a lot of animals who shape the way that humans do things. And some of these dogs, uh, some of these are dogs and birds and they're heroes. Um, some change the way that we understand how animals learn. And some got a really bad rap, uh, like some myths. Um, let me just make sure everybody's muted here. If you guys can make sure you're muted. Thank you. Um, some myths about animals who are perpetuated to this day, like Miss O'Leary's cow who started the Chicago fire. So we're gonna talk about that cow and how that myth got started. And even though it's not true, that cow gave us public libraries. Um, so we're gonna be learning all about these animals today. So let's go. So this bird, if you look down here, I'm gonna get my little pointer up. This is Char Ami and that is French. Um, you see how this bird is missing a leg? That's actually a really important feature of this particular bird. Now, Cher Ami, um, most people don't think of pigeons being in the world's smartest animals category, right? Um, I didn't really think about it until I saw these birds last week. Um, Cher Ami means dear friend in French. And she was a female homing pigeon who saved 194 people all while being shot in her leg, losing her eye, and shot in the chest due to gunfire. How did she do it? Do you guys have any ideas? So there were a group of 550 men that were trapped on the side of a hill behind enemy lines in World War I. They had no food. They had no bullets. They were also receiving what's called friendly fire. And that's when your team starts shooting at you because they think you're the enemy. So friendly fire is it. Um, but then their major, Charles White Whittlesley, started sending messages by homing pigeon. The first one was carrying a message, many are wounded, we can't evacuate. And that bird was shot down. A second bird was sent with a note, men are suffering, can you help us? And that pigeon was also shot down. And then Cher Ami was let out. Um, and when she got shot, she was their last hope. She went up with the message in a canister on her left leg. We are all along the road parallel to 276.4. I think that's a mile marker. Our artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. Please, for heaven's sake, stop it. Then Cherami was shot by Germans when she rose out of the bush, but she was able to keep flying. She flew 25 miles in 25 minutes. That is the same speed you can go on the highway at 60 miles an hour. So that's how fast she had to fly to save 194 of those 550 men while being shot through the chest, blinded in one eye, and shattering a leg. She was actually given a small little wooden leg as like, because they had to amputate her, her leg. So they gave her like a little wooden leg to replace it. And she became a hero of the 77th Infantry. And side note, they thought that she was a boy until they went, until after her death, when they had her stuffed, which is this picture here that you see. This is her body at the uh, Smithsonian Institute, the Smithsonian Museum. Um, and she died at only one year old. Okay, here we go. So some of you guys might have heard about Balto or Togo. Um, these were um, 
when I grew up, I actually grew up in a dog sledding family. So we had dogs like this that pulled dog sleds for fun. Um, and it's a sport that we didn't talk about in the animal sports presentation last week, but it is a fun sport. The story I was told when I was growing up, when I was about your age, was about Balto. And that's the dog over here on the, on the left. Um, this is a dog who saved the town of Nome, Alaska from a deadly diphtheria outbreak. And because this town was so far north, it was just two degrees shy of the Arctic Circle. So if you look at a globe, it's two little notches down from the North Pole. So they're very far north and it's very, very cold up there. Their port frequently became frozen, so boats couldn't get in. The only way to get into that port, into that town, was by dog sled. Now, some of what I'm going to say might sound familiar to you right now. There was a doctor in the town who noticed there was an outbreak of a disease. In this case, it was diphtheria, and he ordered the town into quarantine after a few people had died. And he knew that this outbreak was inevitable, so he tried to save as many people as he could, but he really, really needed the medicine. It was called an anti, uh, oh, what was the name of it? We'll get to it here. It's in my notes a little further down. Oh, an antitoxin. So it wasn't an antibiotic. It was not an antiviral. It was an antitoxin that they used to try to stop this diphtheria outbreak. So the only way, the mortality rate, the death rate, if you got this disease was about 100%. So if you got it, you were going to die. And that's really scary. Um, so enter Balto and Togo. Balto, the dog over here, is the one who usually gets the credit for this, saving the town by getting the medicine to the kids of Nome, Alaska. However, Togo was the lead dog on the longest and most dangerous part of the journey. Togo was purchased after, the, after his owner, his musher, Leonard Sapala. Um, Togo developed a painful throat condition and Sapala tried to sell him, but the dog actually broke out of his new owner's house and ran back to Sapala because he's like, I don't want to leave you. Um, the puppy jumped out of a window of his new owner's house and ran all the way back to Sapala. He was a mischievous pup who was an insatiable runner. So Balto gets the credit for running 55 miles to get the medicine to the kids of Nome. And that's hard work. Running a dog sled is hard work. You're often like in all of your winter gear. So think about your hockey equipment. Um, so those of you who play hockey, you're running in all of your gear behind a dog sled team in the snow, in the deep snow. It's really hard work. Um, you might end up getting frostbite on your nose. Your body might never feel warm. The, wa the weather is so cold up there. Um, but he ran 55 miles, which was only about this much of the race. Togo ran 261 miles. It was the longest leg of what we now call the race for mercy and to save these kids. And he was 12 years old when he did it. Most dogs when they're running races are seven or under. So at 12, he was at the end of his life. So that would be like asking your grandfather to go run a marathon, right? And many do, but it's a lot harder when you're older. Um, so both of these dogs are heroes, as is every dog who ran these teams to save a, top, a town at the top of the world. But while these dogs went on, um, Balto has a statue in New York City, um, and his story got kind of sad after the run for medicine. This, this race to Nome with the medicine became the Iditarod, if you guys have ever heard of the Iditarod. It's a race that is still run every year in Alaska. Um, from uh, Anchorage to Nome, which is across the estate, trying to get medicine to these kids. So what ended up happening with Balto is that um, movie producers wanted the dogs to film a reenactment of the race, and none of that film survived to today because it was just so long ago. Um, but the owners of the dogs were never paid and the dogs were expensive to keep. So as a result, they were transferred uh, Balto's team to a museum where a man named Kimball had heard their story and decided he was going to try to save these dogs. He told the owner that he would buy them for $2,000. That's a ton of money back then. I didn't do the calculation, but that would be a lot of, uh, that would be interesting for you guys to figure out in like the, the price of $2,000 from way back then. Um, 
he only had two weeks to raise it. So school children in Cleveland, Ohio, went around with buckets to collect change for these dogs to get money. Um, and let's see, people at work would take hats around and pe uh, firefighters would try to raise money to save these dogs. Um, the newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, stepped up and promoted the effort to save Balto after he saved the kids of Nome. Um, but after uh, they were transported to Ohio, they made enough money, they got him transferred from California to Ohio, where Balto lived out of his, lived out of his days at the Cleveland Metro Parks Zoo. Um, and he died at age 14 in 1933. And his body is still at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And if you guys wanted to watch the, uh, the stories of these two dogs, there were two movies made. There's Balto, it's a, uh, if, so if you all have Disney Plus, you guys can watch the, um, the Balto movie now. And Togo, I believe is coming out later this year on Disney Plus. I didn't check, but this is a more recent movie. Um, so there you go. Sergeant Stubby is my favorite. And he was the dog that I thought of when I first presented this idea to, to, um, to Heather, who's running the camp. So if you haven't heard of him, um, there was another movie made about him too, and I'll show you guys the picture for that in a minute. But he's my favorite. So Stubby was assigned as a war dog to the 26th Yankee Division in World War I. So this was like 1919 to 1922. So he was, this is a long, long, long time ago, about 100 years ago. So what his job was to do was to alert to mustard gas attacks and bombs from the sky because he could hear it before the humans could. So he could get all of his people to safety. Um, and he was once reported to have discovered an enemy soldier and grabbed him by the butt and held him there until, his, until the army got there and were able to help Stubby. Um, he's the only animal to be promoted to sergeant by way of combat um, on the field. And so how did he become that? Um, well, he was found as a little puppy wandering ar around Yale University, that's in Connecticut, that's not that far from here, um, and where these military men were practicing for the war. Um, and they found this little puppy. And so this guy, Corporal James Convoy, kind of hid him. He would like hide him in his pocket. And then so when they got deployed to France, Convoy stole the puppy and put it in his jacket and nobody noticed. And on boats, it takes you weeks to cross the Atlantic Ocean. So he had to keep the puppy hidden and he was sharing his food with the puppy and like, and he was trying to keep him safe. Um, so when Convoy's commander finally found out about Stubby, because, you know, it's a dog, you're eventually going to find it, right? So kids, don't hide dogs in your room. Your parents will find them. Um, but when they finally found him, the little dog saluted like he was a soldier. It was a trick that Convoy had taught him. So that way, like, oh, he's really cute. We'll keep him. And it worked. Um, so, when, um, so when this little dog saluted, he became a, like a mascot to this group and later a soldier. This dog was hit by grenades and he was moved to the area where injured soldiers healed. And once he healed, he came right back into the trenches with the men. This dog was not afraid of anything. Um, when he did finally die at age 11, his, his body was preserved, just like Charami, and it's in the same area of the Smithsonian Museum. So if you guys ever get a chance to go, you can see Sergeant Stubby and Charami. His obituary, the write-up of his life after he died, was in the New York Times, which is really impressive. Like, you wouldn't think to see a dog's obit in, in the New York Times, but there he was. Um, and it took up a half a page, which is much longer than most humans get in a newspaper. Um, his likeness is used to teach kids about war and kindness to animals and the human-animal bond and what animals can do for humans. And he was a very, very good boy indeed. And here is the picture of those, um, those uh, posters that went around for Sergeant Stubby. So if you guys get a chance to watch it, I think you guys might really enjoy this movie. All right, so this is one I didn't know about, and I'm actually kind of shocked I didn't because this is right up my alley. So imagine it's 1901, the turn of the 19th century, and slavery is still in full force in the United States, and Black men were still considered three-fifths of a person. They couldn't vote. They couldn't uh, get many jobs. Like, this is a terrible, terrible time in our history. Um, 
and it's something that you guys will dive more into as you go through your schooling. Um, but we also lived in a time where animals were often whipped or punished to do things that we wanted them to do. Um, enter William Key, this man um, over here, um, and his horse, beautiful Jim Key. They used to travel the country demonstrating that this horse could do math and make change out of money. How many of you guys can do that, right? It, it's a skill that you have to learn and this horse could make change. Um, they also said that he could cite Bible verses that have horses mentioned in it. How? I'm not entirely sure, but when Dr. William Key was asked, he said he only used kindness to teach his horse. He never used a whip. And that's really powerful coming from a former slave, um, which is really something to think about when you're thinking about like how he, he might have been treated as a human and that he didn't want to do that to animals. And that's how I feel when I train animals. I don't use punishment to hurt them. Um, I want them to work with me because they want to. And I think that he really started this idea of be kind to animals and they will willingly work for you. You don't have to push them into something they don't like. Um, he used kindness and a technique that I use today, gaining trust and positive reinforcement, relationship-based training. Um, that wasn't really in vogue at the end of the century, at the end of the 18th century, 19th century. But now Dr. William Key, a black man, was not allowed to go to school, so he taught himself how to be an effective veterinarian. Um, he taught himself how to read and write. He taught himself all of these things, and he worked with white promoters to get Jim Key in front of people, including the president of the United States, William McKinley at the time. And Mr. McKinley said that the most astonishing and entertaining exhibition I have ever witnessed. And this is an example of what kindness and, and patience can accomplish. So how did these two change history? This horse went on to teach and get two million children to pledge never to be mean to animals in a time before the internet. Getting two million people to get anything done was quite a remarkable feat. And my job as a positive reinforcement trainer absolutely stems from the philosophy that you can do much more with kindness and patience with animals than you ever can with pain and fear. So this, I like this one because it's kind of funny. Um, so this one is a failed mission, uh, spy kitties. We are going to talk about real spy animals in a minute, but this one just kept coming up and up and up again and again and again. I just thought maybe you guys would find this interesting. So perhaps the CIA thought that this was easier said than done. Um, but as someone who trains animals for a living, I'm quite confident that I could have taught a cat to go spy on people. Um, so let's talk about Project Acoustic Kitty. The first kitty, um, so what they had done, you see how in this, um, in here, there's like little radio antennas coming out. They had surgically implanted, the CIA had surgically implanted a little microphone into the ear of this cat. And they had also implanted a wire up the tail to act as almost um, like an antenna to get better reception. And then that would feed back to a van that had recording equipment. So you could send out a cat and if you had two people that you wanted to spy on, you could just send the cat out and eavesdrop and nobody would notice the cat. Or if they did, they wouldn't think anything of it. And you could hear the whole conversation from the van, right? So this seemed really, really cool. Um, but unfortunately, when they let the cat out of the van, it got hit by a taxi cab. Um, and so they didn't have this cat anymore. So their project basically died on the doorstep, which is really sad for the cat. However, um, the CIA said it wasn't just because that cat had been hit by a taxi. They said they just can't train cats. And if you've watched any of my videos and my presentations over the last few weeks, you know that that's not true. Um, cats have, um, are remarkably, remarkably trainable. If we can teach a fish to play soccer or a horse to accept a rider doing gymnastics on his back, or a tiger to present a tail for a blood draw for their veterinarian. Um, you can train a cat to go spy on a person, but I guess they just didn't have the, uh, the knowledge or the bandwidth to really train this cat how to do it. They just let it out and hope for the best. Um, so I bet if they did this today, it would absolutely work. So there are spies who did work, and I really like this picture, and I have like, um, 
this picture here, you see that shadow? That's a raven and he's here on a windowsill. Now, how did this work? And we've got some dolphins with camera equipment. We've got hawks. We've got the cat that I had already talked about through the CIA. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you guys a little bit of a story. Um, uh, Bob Bailey, amazing dog trainer. I actually listened to him speak so that way I could become a dog trainer. So he, he's known for dog training, um, but he has trained every animal. He could teach a spider he, to do tricks. He has taught um, chickens to do agility. So if you guys watched the first week, we did chicken camp. That was Bob Bailey. So the CIA had hired him do you think you can get your raven up there to deposit a device and we can listen? Yes, we can, he said. The bird would be conditioned via a laser pointer to pick out, um, to pick out the right room to go spy in. So at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Bob Bailey created a so-called squab squad. These were pigeons. Pigeons again, right? Pigeons are so cool. I hope you never look at pigeons the same way again, that they are super remarkable instead of like rats with wings. Um, but these pigeons could fly ahead of a column and signal the presence of enemy soldiers by landing. And in tests, they thwarted more than 45 attempts by special forces troops to ambush convoys. So this absolutely worked. Um, so there were other projects that they had used. Some had failed, some had not. Um, but when they did ask him if um, any of the animal projects were actually used in the real world, not just for fun, not just for like practice, not like the acoustic kitty failure. Um, he smiled, Bob Bailey smiled, uncharacteristically laconic, but then a, sm a thin smile cracks his face. We got ravens into places, we got the cats into places, usually using diplomatic pouches, he said, and he carried a raven aboard a commercial flight, an airplane against regulations. He was able to hide the raven under a map case in the front seat of a plane. And every now and again, the raven would make a noise, but I just tell my seatmate um, that it was his chair squeaking. So he was lying to his partner in the, in the air. Um, so yeah, he's like, you don't need a cat right now because, of, um, because technology does all the work that these animals could do. But he said, if we ever needed it, we absolutely could train animal spies, which is really cool to think about. So now we're going to talk about Smokey, the four pound war dog and the very first therapy dog. Now, some of you guys might have actually seen therapy dogs. A couple weeks ago, we had talked about animal jobs and I had talked about the difference between a service dog, an emotional support animal, and a therapy dog. And if you remember, therapy dogs live with one person, but then go to help others. So like in a hospital or a school and make people feel better. So Keep that in the back of your mind while I tell you the story of Smokey. Smokey was found as an adult dog in an abandoned foxhole in World War II. So that was about 1944. So oh, oh, a while ago, before the internet. Um, she was picked up and sold to Corporal William Wynn for two Australian pounds. And that's the equivalent of only $6 today. So the person who sold her just wanted money to make a bet in a poker game. And so he took $6 for this tiny little dog who went on to become the first therapy dog and change our relationship with animals forever. Um, she lived in Wynn's tent, shared his food rations, which they didn't have much to begin with in World War II. Um, and unlike the other hero war dogs that we talked about, like uh, Sergeant Stubby, right? Um, she was not given afforded, uh, she was not given veterinary care. She flew in a backpack dangling next to machine guns for hours on flights. She went on 12 missions. She survived a typhoon in Japan and survived 150 air raids. Um, that's bombs from airplanes. She survived 150. She's four pounds. Like imagine your hands and a little dog that could fit in it. That was her. Um, so she would also hear the whistling of the bombs coming before the men could, so she would alert and bark and would save the men on many occasions, just like Sergeant Stubby did. And she even parachuted out of planes with her own little parachute. Um, she would learn and perform tricks for the soldiers, giving them a bright spot in their day. And these tricks actually helped her build a massive air base. So the United States had a communications department, right? So you had to talk on walkie-talkies to like communicate 
um, plans for the war or if like injuries were coming in, you needed to have communications working. Um, so the communications department needed to get a telegraph wire, a tiny little wire um, through a 70 foot pipe. Now 70 feet is basically seven, um, think about a basketball net, right? Seven of those stacked on top of each other, that's 70 feet. Um, so she needed, the pipe was too small for the men to get through and they couldn't thread the wire through. So what they would have had to have done was bring in a bunch of um, men to dig up the pipe, which would show the enemies where they were, put them all at risk for getting shot or bombed, or they could see if they could fit this four pound dog through the pipe. So what they tried was um, they noticed that the pipe was weak in the joints, dirt filtered through, filling the pipe in some spots, so only four inches of space. So four inches is about, oh, I, I'm blinking out because of my background, four inches is about that big. Um, so it's not very big at all. So Wynne tied a string and the telegraph wire to Smokey's collar, and he sent her into the pipe. And without her, communications would not have been able to reach the base. And this is before cell phones or the internet, or any of today's normal communication. Zoom calls did not exist in 1944. Um, she was able to save that base and she did the work in four minutes, what would have taken 250 men to do in three days of work, putting them all at risk. So after the war, she was on TV, appeared in like 40 different TV shows and she never repeated a trick. So she was a smart little cookie. Um, she went into veterans war hospitals to visit soldiers injured from the war to cheer them up, which makes her the first documented therapy dog. She has given special dispensation to sleep with the wounded wind for five nights in a hospital. Most animals weren't allowed to sleep with their owners, but she was because she was so special. Um, she died at age 14 and there's a massive monument in her honor for this tiny dog in the Cleveland Metro parks over her final resting space. She had a larger than life monument for a tiny but mighty little dog. So the rats of the Black Plague. Ooh. So I like this story because it kind of shows us that with science, we can, we can recognize that we were wrong. <laughs> so in the 1300s, a sudden black death went through Europe and it killed healthy people apparently overnight. Now this was before we had anything that looked like medicine today. Our doctors looked interesting. This, um, this outfit here, let me show you guys this. Oops, let's see, can I move that? There we go. This is a plague doctor outfit. Now you guys might see it uh, from time to time. Um, people are, are bringing this back with our current COVID stuff. You might see people with funny masks like this. Um, they're just paying homage to the Black Plague doctors. But this is a doctor who would go and try to help you. And I think that doctors looked a lot scarier back in the 1300s. Um, so the Black Plague started when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked in Sicily, and that's in Italy. And those on the docks were met with the most horrific discovery. Most sailors aboard the ship were dead. Um, and those who were still alive were gravely ill and covered in black boils all over their body that oozed blood and puss. Ick, right? That's really scary and really gross. So they named these the death ships, right? And they were immediately ordered out of the harbor, but it was already too late. The infection got out. Um, and this introduced the plague to Europe. And over the next five years, the Black Death would kill more than 20 million people in Europe. That is a third of the continent's population. Um, the rats have always been blamed for this. Rats traveled on ships and were considered dirty vermin. Um, the plague never really ended and it returned with a vengeance a few years later, but officials in the Venetian controlled port city were able to slow its spread by get this, this is not going to sound unfamiliar, uh, keeping sailors in isolation until it was clear they were not carrying the disease, creating social distancing that relied on isolation to slow the spread of the disease. Sound familiar? The sailors that were initially held on their ships for 30 days, a Trento, right? Oh, sorry, Trentino. I do not speak Italian. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, 
but that was later increased to 40 days or quarantine. Uh, that is the origin of the name quarantine, 40 days in isolation. Um, but we know a little bit more now thanks to science. So remember how I said rats got a bad rap in all of this, right? It turns out because the plague is still alive here in modern times, but we have medicine that can nip it in the bud really fast. Um, it's not nearly as deadly as it was in the 1300s before medicine and science. Um, but we found out that it might not have been the rats at all. It was us. We are disgusting. <laughs> so in modern times, the disease is most commonly spread to humans when flea, when like little fleas, right, that eat on infected rats go on to bite humans. This also could have happened during the Black Death, like when infected rats might have died, the fleas could have jumped from the dead rat to people biting them and giving them the illness. So maybe the rats were still involved, right? But according to the Centers for Disease Control and LiveScience.com, which is a fantastic website if you guys are curious about this kind of thing, the Black Death spread much further and faster and killed so many more people than modern outbreaks do. This led researchers to think that maybe the human parasites played a bigger role, not the fleas in the Black Death. So fleas and lice could have fed on infected humans and transmitted the disease to other humans. Now in the 1300s, people didn't bathe very much and we had little lice that lived on us, whether it was in our hair or on our bodies. And those were easily transmitted between people. Um, so it does look like overall the results suggest that plague transmission in European epidemics occurred predominantly through human parasites, not the commensal rat or pneumonic transmission. So meaning not like fleas that bit rats and then us, and not through pneumonic <coughs> cough, not airborne, um, which is fascinating. So these rats that, it, that we thought had changed history, and they did. And for, let's see, the 1300s, we're in the 2000s now, for 700 years, the rats got the blame for this. Um, and now people think like maybe rats don't deserve a chance. I think otherwise. Um, I love rats. They're super trainable. They're really fun. Domestic rats are super cool. City rats do skeeve me out though. Um, and speaking of another myth, Miss O'Leary's cow. Now some of you guys might have known this, but in 1871, so we're talking of, you know, about a hundred and some odd years ago, a two-night fire burned through the city of Chicago. 17,000 buildings burned down. 300 people died in this fire, and the city was devastated. Now, we didn't have fire trucks, right? And we didn't really have modern technology to stop this fire, and everything was built out of old wood. So, of course, fire spread super easily through this new city. Um, the other problem here was that there was a really long dry spell. So they hadn't had rain in a really long time. So things were easily spread. The story goes that Miss O'Leary's cow knocked over a lantern while she was being milked. So this picture down here is a common picture that you guys might see a lot as you guys get older. Mrs. O'Leary's cow knocking over the lantern, right? And that story is still circulated today. However, it is really important to note that sometimes a myth and a funny story aren't exactly what they seem. So Mrs. O'Leary was in her home asleep as cows are milked in the morning and the fire started at night. Um, let's see, reporter Michael Ahern published an article in the newspaper saying that the cow knocked over the lantern which started the fire. And that's the myth that continues to this day. But 12 years later, Michael Ahern admitted that he just made up the story. But Mrs. O'Leary never was forgiven, was never forgiven by the community, um, by the long circulated lie. Yes, the fire started near her barn, but it's more likely that embers from a chimney had jumped and maybe started in the grass near her barn. Um, or maybe the kids that were playing behind her barn might have knocked over a lantern. There were other things that were more likely to have occurred instead of putting the blame on poor Mrs. O'Leary and her cow, the cow who died during the fire. But the other factor that is super important to note here is that Michael Ahern, the reporter, lied and he picked an easy target, an Irish immigrant, 
Now, anti-Irish sentiment was super high at this time. And like history, societies always find someone other to blame. And the society is almost always willing to believe it because it's easy. Mrs. O'Leary eventually died of pneumonia and a broken heart after bearing the weight of the blame of the largest urban fire in history um, and the deaths of hundreds and her cow. However, some good news does come from this story, and this is why I wanted to include it. Help flowed into the city from, the near, from near and far after this devastating fire. The city government improved building codes to stop rapid spreads of future fires, right? So a lot of our building codes come from this. Um, and a donation from the United Kingdom, like in England, in Europe, um, that part of the world over there on the other side of the sea, um, decided that they were going to send us money, send money to the people of Chicago and make the Chicago Public Library this is a free public library system, which is in contrast to the private, you have to pay to borrow a book system they had before the fire. Um, so because of this, the Chicago Public Library was created directly from the ashes of the Great Chicago Fire. Um, so yes, while there is a cow that got a bad rap and really didn't start the fire, because that reporter wrote about this cow in this accidental poor woman and her cow that started a fire that they really didn't, other people took sympathy on the city and decided to do some really nice things for them, including creating a library system that we still use today all over the country. And here's the last one for today. Did you guys know, this is super cool, You every medication that you have taken, especially if it's a vaccine, um, or you've used intravenous um, medications of any sort has to be tested by horseshoe crabs. And did you know they have blue blood? So horseshoe crabs are one of the few creatures on earth who have, sur who have survived multiple mass extinctions on earth, including they were here before the dinosaurs and outlived the dinosaurs. So they're pretty special and their evolution hasn't changed them very much at all. So I think nature looked at the horseshoe crab and says, well, if it ain't broke, why fix it? So what you see when you are looking at a horseshoe crab is a living fossil. How cool is that, right? So scientists have discovered that the secret to their ability to survive mass extinctions and 17 ice ages, while other creatures haven't, it might be their blood. And if you look here, it's blue. This is their blood. What? Our blood's red, right? And that's because it carries oxygen and it's rich in iron. These guys, their blood also carries oxygen, but they use a different method of carrying oxygen through their body. It's copper. So their blood also contains a special ingredient called LAL. And LAL is a mighty defense that might be the key to the horseshoe crab survival and our own. See, under a microscope, LAL will attack any little bacteria that's present, right? So if a company is testing a new medication, a new IV, a new needle, an intubation tube, anything that you might see in a hospital that goes into your body, um, they are using this LAL under a microscope to make sure it's safe. Um, so this is to make sure that introducing new bacteria into our body, which could kill us, doesn't happen. So if you know someone who has a replacement hip, I have screws in my right foot. They were tested with LAL to make sure they were safe to go into my body. Um, so thousands of these crabs are caught every year and they essentially donate their blood. They give a third of it to us every year. It's collected and then the crabs are returned delicately back to the ocean. But 15% of those crabs do die during this blood transmission process. Um, so scientists are looking for new ways to create like a synthetic version of a, 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 a version of this that doesn't require an animal to donate its blood of LAL. And some companies have actually done it. But if synthetics are used instead of the real crabs, they might lose their protected status. And fishermen can then use them again to use for baits for better creatures, which is not ideal. So people who love crabs 
and those who love birds are petitioning to make sure that they remain protected even if we do come up with an, a better synthetic to help us in our medicine. Um, why the bird people? Well, because horseshoe crab eggs are a valuable food source for migrating birds. So if the crab numbers are good, these birds survive and so do the crabs. But if the crab numbers are low, it kills birds and it can crash a whole ecosystem. Um, so if medical science evolves beyond us needing these crabs, we have to do our part to save them because they have been saving us for over half a century. We need to save their environment, and make sure they survive because they have given us so much and they cannot hurt you. And How if you long do find a century? one, oh, a century is a hundred years. That's a long time, right? So if they cannot hurt you and you happen to find one, they cannot hurt you. You can grab it by the sides. Don't ever grab it by its tail because that can hurt it a lot, right? So if you find one on a beach and it's upside down and wiggling, you can tip it over, just grab it by the sides and flip it. And I bet it would be very happy that you helped him out. Um, and if we do get a COVID vaccine or the next time you get a flu shot, think of the horseshoe crab because without him, you wouldn't be able to be safe and he has made your health possible. So here we go. We're going to go into our resources for today. So this is where I got today's information and I implore you guys, if you guys want, you can take a screenshot, you can hit the print screen thing, or I can make sure that I get this information to Heather for you. Um, but share me from the Smithsonian Institute, Balto from the Cleveland Metro National History, um, Togo National Parks Service. So these are all pretty reputable websites. So you don't want to just look on the internet and just find something because then you would never know that Miss O'Leary's cow was actually innocent um, because most websites will probably just circulate the lies. So you need to find what are called reputable sources. So Slate is a good one. Archive.org for beautiful Jim Key and Acoustic Kitty. Animal Spies was from the Smithsonian Online. Smokey the Yorkie, I did get from Wikipedia, but I did check a lot of those sources that they used. Plague Rats and the Fleas from Science News for Students and Live Science. Miss O'Leary's Cow, again, Wikipedia, but I cross-checked with the resources that they had used in Wikipedia. So don't just take Wikipedia's uh, for, for proof because everybody can edit it. But if you check the resources in there, you're set. And Horseshoe Crabs. I got that from Curio Kids. And if you guys like podcasts, there's a great one called Radio Lab. And I had just heard this story about the horseshoe crabs this week listening to this podcast. So if you like podcasts, you can listen to Radio Lab. They have a four kids version, um, which are just the same ones that the adults listen to, but they just might talk, not talk about some of the more political stuff. So I think you guys might like that a lot. So that is today's presentation. Let me stop my share. Boop. And guys, I before I let you guys go and uh, have you guys ask questions. Again, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, if you guys are curious about working with dogs or if you guys wanted to learn anything else about animals going forward, please feel free to reach out. My email address, um, I can get it to Heather and she can get it to you guys. Or if you guys see these on YouTube, you can just comment in it and I will see it and I will get in touch with you. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This has been a joy and I hope to see you guys again soon.